Right. Good morning, everyone. Uh, welcome to a new week. Uh, and before we begin, let's uh, say, say a word of prayer. Sid, would you like to pray? Yes, Pastor. Go ahead. Father, we come to the throne of grace, Lord. Thank you for this day, the new day you have given us, Lord. Lord, as we are going to learn about your covenant, Lord, your blood, Lord, about your cross, Lord. Lord, whatever the sacrifice you have done for us, Lord, Lord, it will not go in vain, Lord. Lord, we promise that we will bring thousands of souls in your in your presence, oh Lord. Lord, give us your, your fear, your knowledge, Lord, so that we can understand whatever is being taught by the pastor, Lord. Lord, whatever the teaching we are getting, Lord, not it should not go in vain, but it should be used for the expansion of your kingdom, Lord. Thank you for this opportunity that you have given us through APC Bible College to learn you about your word, Lord. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. 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 Thank you so much, Sid. All right. So last week we completed chapter four. Uh, let's just do a quick review. I know there was a lot of material that was covered uh, from the beginning of this course. Uh, so chapter one, we looked at God is a God who makes covenants. Right? He is a God who has made a covenant with Abraham and then he has made a covenant with us. So God is not just somebody up there in heaven and we are here on earth, we are living our life and he's up there. No, God is a God of relationship. And so we saw that in chapter one that he made a covenant with Abraham. He made a covenant with Moses. And then through the Lord Jesus Christ was another blood covenant. And so God, the reason for these covenants is because God wants to have a relationship with us. Right? It's not like, okay, these are the set of, of rules. You have to obey it. And only then, you know, you're in the covenant. No. God, being a holy God, being a just God, being a righteous God, uh, is a God who expects us to walk in that same manner. And so that's why God, uh, you know, set certain covenants for us. Then we looked at covenant names, which was powerful. Jehovah Rapha, Jehovah Shama, Jehovah Sidkenu, Jehovah uh, Aroi, El Shaddai, uh, El Adonai. And so we saw that God was making a covenant not just on who he is, but also the nature of his of who he is, right? Of who God is. Uh, we saw all through the Old Testament, and even now, those covenant names stands. Right, you and I being in the covenant or in the new covenant, we cannot say, okay, uh, you know, Jehovah Shalom and Jehovah Rapha, Jehovah Shama, they're all for the old covenant. We can't say that because they still hold fast. They still hold fast thousands of years back. They still hold true now, and they will hold true till the end of time. Right. So, as people of the covenant, you and I can stand on God's covenant and say, God, this is what you have promised. And so I stand on this covenant. Like, for example, we looked at, you know, when we studied about the names of God and the nature of who he is. For example, somebody is unwell. What we can do, we stand on his covenant. What is his covenant? God, you are the Jehovah Rapha, the God who heals me. And so we're standing not on what we are we are saying. We're standing on what the what God has spoken and about his nature. We are standing on that. Right? And so his covenant is true. And so we looked at the wonderful, wonderful promises, the wonderful nature and the names of God that you and I have uh, that we can declare. In chapter three, we looked at uh, you know the 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 blood covenant, understanding how wonderfully uh, God established this blood covenant. First, He told Abraham, Abraham, I have made you the father of many nations. Right, and this is powerful. Uh, we looked at that example of how God called Abraham out of nowhere. He said, Abraham, I've made you the father of many nations. Now, the choice of words is so powerful. God is not saying, I will make you, I am going to make you, or you will be. No, I have made you already a past tense. And what does God do after he says that? He backs up that covenant 
with his own word. He says, I am the mediator to that covenant. Right. So when he's probably Abraham was thinking, God, how can I be a father to many nations when I myself am not a father in my own house? But God was reminding Abraham and saying, Abraham, I am a God who will make covenants and I am the mediator to my own covenant. So you will not get a better mediator than me itself. So what I'm saying, I myself am standing to it. And so he backed that up. He said, I will make this covenant and this, you will, your name, I will change your identity. I will take you, I'll change your location, meaning I'll take you to a place which you don't know, which you haven't heard about. And, and then he also made a blood covenant. He made Abraham cut the, an animal, put it on the offering. And we see that in Genesis, God himself walks in between the offering, pouring blood on the offering, signifying and telling Abraham, Abraham, this is my promise on my own blood. I'm saying this, that coming, going forward, your generation will be like the stars of heaven. What a powerful covenant. Then he made another blood covenant with Moses. He said, Moses, I'm going to make a blood covenant with you. I promised Abraham that your nation, the nation of Israel, will, will be a blessed nation. I promised Abraham that his, the generation will go on and on and on. And I'm, since I made a blood covenant there, I'm making another blood covenant with you, Moses. And he says to Moses, cut the offering, sprinkle the blood, and that will be a blood covenant. We see God made two covenants there, two blood covenants. What is the significance? Last week, we studied about the significance of a blood covenant. The blood covenant is, is life for life. Right? I must be willing to give my life to the other person. The other person must be willing to give their life for me. If It's not only life, but also material needs and everything that they have, I must be willing to give it to the other person because he is in blood covenant with me. So when we look at all of this and you look at the cross, it makes, you know, the, the, the two make so much sense when you bring it together. And you see the Lord Jesus gave all of himself, right? He gave on his own free will, the Lord Jesus gave himself as a blood covenant. And no more is there a need for the Old Testament sacrifices and all those uh, rituals not required. Remember that the old covenant, the blood that was smeared, uh, that the high priest took, that blood was only an atonement or a covering for sins. But here the Lord Jesus the blood covenant he made was the washing away, the cleansing of sins. And so when we study the Old Testament uh, and when we dig deep and study about the tabernacles and the outer court, the courtyard, the inner court, the most holy place and how sacrifices were made, all of them signify or point to the Lord Jesus Christ. And... Uh, also, yesterday we saw, last week, sorry, last week we saw that we are people of the covenant. And as people of the covenant, God has made a distinction, right? So, for example, when the Lord, when God looks at us, he says, okay, this boy, this child is a child of the covenant. Remember the Lord Jesus in his ministry, the woman with a bent back? What did, what did Jesus say to her? How can this woman, being part of the covenant, continue to be suppressed and oppressed by the enemy? Right? Remember Jesus did that? He said, how can this woman, with, you know, being part of the covenant, be oppressed and, you know, by the enemy? And the Lord Jesus brings healing. So God draws a distinction between those who are in the covenant and those who are not in the covenant. Right. Does it mean that God is showing partiality? No. Right. When we look to the Old Testament, God chose Israel. But then there were other nations, the Amorites, the Moabites, the uh, Kizites, and there are different nations there. But God chose 
Israel. And when we are part of the covenant, he draws a distinction. Now, the distinction has blessings. But if we do not obey those blessings, we saw last week that we will turn, it will turn into curses. Right? And Deuteronomy 28, uh, you know, uh, uh, the writer writes and he says, Moses writes and he's reminding the people, God has given us covenants. God has given us promises. Now, if we don't obey it, there will be challenges. There will be oppression. There will be sickness. There will be diseases. There will be death. But when you obey it, you will see the blessings of God flow into your lives, into your families. And so Deuteronomy 29 pictures that whole, um, you know, paints a good picture on keeping covenant promises. Uh, the Lord Jesus has called us as his covenant, as a special people, and we are overtaken by blessings. Uh, and as covenant people, we don't look at the situations ahead of us in fear. I remember we looked at uh, the example of David last week. Entire army of Israel are fearful. They are wondering, what do we do? This man, Goliath, is standing in front of us. He's, you know, oppressing us. He's he's tormenting us. He's saying we, he's going to destroy us. And then David comes into the scene. And what, what happens? David says, how can this uncircumcised Jew, when he says uncircumcised, he what he meant was he is he's not in the covenant. How can this person, Goliath, an uncircumcised man, come against the God of Israel, the God who made a co covenant with us? How can this man, he's uncircumcised, he's not even in the covenant, come against the people of God's, you know, in the covenant? And so when David saw Goliath, he didn't look at, okay, Goliath is, you know, 10 feet or 12 feet and he's got all these things. When David saw Goliath, David saw himself first as part of the covenant of God. And two, when he saw Goliath, he saw him as he's not part of the covenant. And he is going against not me, but he's going against God. And that was where, even before he stepped in to go and fight against Goliath, he had already won it in his mind, right? So as people of the covenant, when we are walking, uh, you know, our life, we will see troubles, we will see challenges. But the moment we think about this and say, God, we are part of your covenant. I am part of what you did for me. The blood that was shed on the cross was for me. You defeated the enemy for me. I'm part of that covenant. When we look at ourselves that way, we will be able to you know, face the enemy. Paul writes it so beautifully. He says, fight the good fight of faith, which means what? It, it, it's not going to be easy. You know, Just because we are Christians, uh, part of the covenant doesn't mean that things are going to be easy. But we got to fight the good fight. Right. As part of the covenant. So we we, st we stopped here in chapter 4. Um, we'll get into chapter 5. Before we do that, uh, any questions, any thoughts uh, uh, that you'd like to share? Any questions on the covenants? Uh, till now, whatever we've studied. Any questions, any thoughts? Is everyone able to, you know... Uh, uh, track along. Is, are you able to understand? And is it making you know? Are you able to relate the, these covenants to the cross and to what Jesus is? So, okay, great. Uh, another th thing. Last week, I think uh, it was Zilatoli who asked about uh, the salt of the uh, the salt covenant. There are two ways to say it. One is the salt covenant and the salt of the covenant. Uh, so yes, Zilatoli. Uh, uh, there is more we can study more about it later on because there are a lot of things you know god tells them you know some offerings you put salt so salt is a preservative and it, it has different flavors and all kinds of things so uh, we will study more on the salt of the covenant but what i can do is i have uh i did listen to a couple of videos I, i'll just put the link here um so you can uh, listen to this um, 
uh, it just talks about the salt of the covenant and what uh, God tells the people of Israel. You know, there are some offerings. He says, put the salt only on these kind of offerings. And there's the unleavened bread, put the salt. So we'll study more on that going further on as well. So in the meanwhile, uh, you can uh, watch this video. It's just an audio. Uh, so you'll get a better idea on uh, what the salt covenant is. And All right, let's move to chapter 5. My covenant in your mouth. Right? My covenant in your mouth. Uh, let's read Deuteronomy chapter 30, verse 11 to 14. Yes, could one of us please read that? I'm on page, oh, sorry, let me just check that. Uh, I'm on page 27. Deuteronomy 30, 11 to 14. Deuteronomy 30, verses 11. For his commandment, which I command you today, is too mysterious for you, nor it is far off. It is not in heaven that you should say, Who will ascend into the heavens for us, and bring it to us, that we may hear it and do it? Nor is it beyond the sea that you should say, Who will go over the sea for us, and bring it to us, that we may hear it and do it? But the word is very near you, in your mouth and in your heart, that you may do it. Amen. Thank you, Sid. So, now, the book of Deuteronomy, the word deuto, uh, I'm sure you know this, uh, the word deuto is a reminder. Now, what happened was, the people of Israel have gone round that mountain on and on and on. And now, the next generation right, don't know what is happening. Why are they even there? You know, the first generation have seen the miracles. They've seen the wonderful work that the Lord has done. Just the next generation don't know what's happening. Um, and so God instructs Moses, you write a reminder, duto, which means a second time. Write it and remind the people of Israel what I did for them. How with my mighty hand, I brought the people of uh, uh, Israel out of Egypt and the wonderful miracle. So the whole book of Deuteronomy is a reminder. And so here he is reminding, for this command which I command you today is not too mysterious for you, nor is it far off. Right Now, when, when we use the word command, it's also uh, uh, you know synonym for covenant. Right? This, this command or this covenant which I am giving you today, it's not very far off. It's not mysterious, right? Uh, it's not up in the heaven where you should go search for it or uh, uh, not beyond the seas where you can go, where you have to go and bring it to you. But what is this covenant? Verse 14 is powerful. But the word is very near you. It is in your mouth and in your heart that you may do it, right? So he's reminding, Moses is reminding the people that the covenant is not some, some special writing on tablets alone. It's not just those 10 commandments which I you know, brought down from the mountain and then we put it into the tabernacle. It's not only that. It's not the physical only, but the word is very near you it is in your mouth and it is in your heart. I'm sure we've uh, you know, heard about this verse, Proverbs 18, 21. Life and death are in the power of your tongue and those who eat it will live of its fruit. Right? So that's powerful. What we speak is what we will become. The more we speak, the words of God, the, wo the more we declare God's promises upon our lives, the more we'll be inclined to fulfill God's promises. The more we say negative or we talk about things that you know are uh, causing death and destruction and we talk wrong things that are not in line with the word of God, we will eat of its fruit. Right? Uh, and, and so it's very important as believers that we understand the power of words. Life and death are in the power of our tongue. Now, you know, growing up, sometimes, you know, uh, as young people, we, we say things. 
Um, and we don't really mean it, but we have said it. And we realize, hey, I shouldn't have said that. Here's the thing. As we continue to mature in Christ, we as believers need to know how to you know, control and use our words in the right manner. Because life and death are in the power of your tongue. And here, Moses is reminding the people, don't go looking Go and go running to the tabernacle alone. Don't go here looking here and there for uh, promises. The promise, the covenant is near you. It is in your mouth. It is in your heart. All you have to do is speak it. All you have to do is declare it. All you have to do is to believe it. Right? And uh, and even Luke chapter 6, 6 verse 45. Uh, could one of us please read that? Luke 6, 45. Uh, it's not in your notes, but it's just additional. Uh, Luke 6, 45. The good man out of the good treasure of his heart brings forth what is good. And the evil man out of the evil treasure brings forth what is evil. For his mouth speaks from what which from that which fills his heart. Yeah, thanks, John. So we see here, the man speaks of what fills his heart. And some other versions say, out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks, right? So what we have in store, so basically, you know, Moses is trying to tell the people, what you have inside you is what you will speak, right? If there's hatred, jealousy, anger, we will speak words of that itself coming out of our mouth. If there's love, joy, peace, patience, we will speak words of fruitfulness, words of life, not only to ourselves, but also to the people around us. So God is saying here, my covenant is in your mouth. You decide. Right. You have to decide. There's, uh, you know, it's not a decision that I have to take. But God is saying, I made the covenant. You take the decision. Are you going to choose life or death? Right. And so as believers, very important. You know, sometimes we may know a lot about the Bible, knowledge. Uh, but to apply that in our lives, uh, you know, we may fail we must not. We must say, God, your word is in my heart. Your word is in my mouth. And every time I speak it, I want to declare your word. I want to declare your promises. You know, sometimes when we are praying, God may give you some certain visions or dreams or prophetic words. Don't push it aside and say, I don't think this is God. It may look like something too big to understand. Say, God, if I receive what you have for me, out of the abundance of your heart, your mouth speaks. Right. So he's telling the, the, the Israelites, listen to what you speak. Think about what you speak. Your, the, the covenant, the promise is near you. It is in you. It's in your heart. Now, if it's not in your heart, we need to repair that. We need to make sure that all the evil, all the things that are not of God are removed from our heart and our heart is filled with the word of God. Psalms 50, 14 to 17. Let's read that as well. Psalms 50, 14 to 17. Go ahead. Anyone? Psalms Psalms 50 verses 14. Offer to God thanksgiving and pay your vows to the Most High. Call upon me in the day of trouble. I will deliver you and you shall glorify me. But to the wicked God says, What right have you to declare my status or take my covenant in your mouth? Seeing you hate instructions and cast my words behind you. Amen. Taking up to 17. Thanks, uh, Sirkina. Right. So here, this is a wonderful verse, Psalms 50, 14 uh, onwards. Now, a lot of times we have 
you know, uh, said this. I myself have said this. You know, uh, call upon me in the day of trouble. I will deliver you, and uh, you shall be. You shall glorify me. These are wonderful promises. But what is important is to also look at the previous verse. Offer to God thanksgiving, and pay your vows to the Most High. So what does he say here? Before you call upon me in the day of trouble, offer to God thanksgiving. What is thanksgiving? Offer to God uh, words of praise, words of giving him glory. God, I don't understand why this trouble is coming ahead of me, but I thank you that you are in, in control. I thank you that you are uh, you know, you have called me to be part of your covenant. So it's not only Psalms 50, 15, which we keep saying, call upon me in the day of trouble, I will deliver you. But before that, offer God th thanksgiving. Let our words say, God, these challenges I see ahead of me looks like an impossible situation, looks like trouble, looks like challenges. But Lord, I'm going to trust in you because I am part of your covenant. I'm going to speak words that will only bring a good change to the situation. I will speak words of life to the situation. And then after giving thanks, when we call upon him on the day of trouble, he will deliver us. That's what even Daniel did. Remember Daniel is taken, uh, now he's, he's well advanced in Babylon. Uh, he's serving under the Persian king now. And what happened? He said, if you, you know, worship any other god, we'll throw you into the lion's den. But what did uh, Daniel do? He offered thanksgiving to God. And he was normal. He called upon God in the day of trouble. And God delivered him. But how can we give thanks when I know that I'm going into the lion's den? He fulfilled this, he said. Give thanks, and then God will deliver me in the times of trouble. So taking God's word in your mouth is taking God's covenant in your mouth. Can you picture that? It's, it's so strong. It's so powerful. When you and I take God's word in our mouth, it's like we're standing on God's promises, <clears throat> on God's covenant, and that is powerful. Right? Next one. He says, choose life and death or, sorry, life and blessings or death and cursing. Deuteronomy 30 verse 19. Let's read that. Deuteronomy 30 and verse 19. I call heaven and earth to witness against you today that I have set before you life and death and blessing and the curse. So choose life in order that you may live, you and your descendants, by loving the Lord your God, by obeying his voice and by holding fast to him. For this is your life and length of your days, that you may live in the land which the Lord swore to your fathers, to Abraham, Isaac and Jacob to give them. Thank you, John. So Deuteronomy 30, 19, this is wonderful. He's saying here, I call heaven and earth as witnesses today against you that I set before you life and death, blessings and curses. Therefore, you choose life. Right? So God has made this covenant. Of course, he, we, we didn't study about that. And he's saying you have the choice. You and I have the choice to choose whether we want life or death. This reminds me of in the book of Joshua. Joshua chapter 24, I think it's Joshua, yes, Joshua 24. The people of Moses is dead and he's gone. Joshua's brought the people out. He's entered the promised land. He calls all the rulers, all the leaders, the priests, the judges. He calls everyone, the leaders of the tribes, of the 12 tribes. And he makes everyone stand. And he says this powerful thing. He repeats history to them. He says, okay, people, you are all the leaders. You're all uh, overseeing uh, the people of uh, the Jews. And now here's what happened. We were in bondage. 
Joshua 24, he gives that whole, you know, it was like a whole lecture that he gives. He says, Josh, you know, you were in bondage. God chose Moses, brought you out in his powerful hand. We came into the wilderness. We saw the wonderful miracles that God did. And then we saw the enemies being destroyed ahead of us. And then we came in. We saw the walls come crumbling down. And, and now we're here. We've entered the promised land. And then he says, Joshua 24, 15, choose this day whom you are going to serve. Earlier on, even in the desert, you were choosing to serve the God of Baal, the God of uh, Egypt, the God of the Amorites, the God of the Canaanites, and all these idols. You, you were willing to worship them. Now, God has fulfilled his side of the covenant. He's brought us into the promised land. Now, you choose this day whom you're going to serve. Are you going to serve the God of Egypt, the God of Amorites, the God of the Canaanites, or are you going to serve the Lord God of Israel? So Joshua is saying, you choose. Choose this day whom you are going to serve. And he backs that up by saying, but as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord our God. So Joshua is giving them strict instructions. And he said, you choose. If we go on, they all said, no, we will choose the God of Israel. God is a true God. But few going further on from Joshua goes on. Uh, after Joshua passes away, the judges come. They again fall back into sin. They again go into worship of Baals and idols. So, here, Joshua is giving them a choice. He said, you choose. You, you got the God of Baal. You got the God of Egypt. You got the God of Amorites. If you want to go there and worship them, go ahead. Nobody's going to stop you. But if you want to choose the God of Israel, this is what you will have. This is the promised land. So you choose. If you want to go, you can go back. But if you choose to... Uh, you know, worship the God of Israel, you can come enter into the promised land. The choice is ours. Even now, in the new covenant, when the Lord Jesus, uh, you know, when we see the ministry of our Lord Jesus, he gave the choice to the people. He didn't force. He didn't force them. When he called Peter and when he called Andrew, he said, come follow me. He gave the choice to them. He called Matthew. He said, come follow me, Matthew. He gave the choice to them. God is not a God who will pressurize us. He says, I'm giving you the choice. Even now, where if we turn away from God, right? Uh, God, yes, uh, his Holy Spirit will uh, you know, convict us. He will remind us. He will stop us. But, you know, why is it that we hear of so many Christians and strong believers, even so that pastors and ministers of God serving in the ministry for many years have turned their back against God. Because it's a choice and God doesn't stop them. It's a choice. Right? And, and so God is telling us in Deuteronomy 30, you choose. There's life, there's death, there's blessings, there's curses. Choose this day whom you're going to serve. But as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. Right? So that is that should be our response. Even as we look ahead, even as we, uh, you know, look at life, even in this, uh, you know, uh, century that we are in. Now, the gods may be not idols or what we see around, you know, but anything that takes the place of God, takes God's priority, becomes an idol. Right, uh, reminded of this young man who's part of our church, and he's telling me, "I'm just so addicted to this these games on the phone. So he cannot stay without his phone. He's if you give him a phone, this is what he was sharing with me. You give me a phone, I don't, I don't want anybody. I don't need anybody. Phone and internet. That's all he needs." So he's, he was telling me, I, I would ask him, hey, why didn't you come to church? He said, no, I want to come, 
but this is a challenge. And he was sharing with me. And I remember sharing this with him. I said, see, you know the Lord. You know that you accepted the Lord Jesus. You know everything. I don't have to share the gospel with you. But here's what God told Joshua in the Old Testament. He said, you got to choose this day whom you're going to serve. It is about your life. As a pastor, as a leader, I can just tell you what is right and what is wrong. But it's your choice. He's just 22 years old. He's got his exams coming. He hasn't even, you know, he doesn't even, he hasn't even gone to college and he's going through uh, a tough time. The parents are worried. Uh, and so it, it's important that we, you know, turn away from these idols of the world, what the world is offering, what the enemy tries to, you know, steal the time that we have. We are to speak life. We are to speak blessings. We are to speak out of the abundance of our heart. Now, for example, if we are all the time, right, watching TV or, you know, doing things that are uh, not beneficial for us, you know, nothing wrong in watching TV. But what I'm trying to say is if we are always focused on that, on the, you know, on, on things that are, uh, you know, not beneficial for us, what will happen? All of that fills into us and it fills into our heart. And then out of the abundance of that, our mouth will speak. You know, uh, if you got, uh, I was just reading a couple of weeks back, a very sad story. Uh, a young man, uh, this happened in the West. Uh, they, their parents were good believers, uh, are good believers. And, uh, you know, he had a good upbringing. But this young boy, this happened about a couple of months ago in the West. Uh, and when I read that article, I just thought how the enemy can, you know, take us away from the covenant, the blessings of God. This young man was, you know, it was a birthday gift. He got a PlayStation and he began to display games and, and slowly it just, you know, increased and increased. And he would always play games. The parents were worried. They took away that. But somehow he would save money. He would get his friend's uh, PlayStation and he would play. And what would he play? He would only play these games which involved, you know, shooting and killing and bloodshed and murdering and all these kind of games. And so he was playing that uh, for months and months, for hours, continually. Then a thought came to his mind, and he was also uh, sharing in this article. A thought came to his mind that he wanted to see blood. Right? So he wanted to, so he would cut himself, he would see blood, he was excited. But that, that feeling got more and more, that urge to see death and blood was so much increasing in him. A thought came, I want to kill somebody. And what happened was, uh, the thought was so strong in him, he went, one day he went to his parents' bedroom, and he killed his parents. And he saw the blood, he saw death, and he was satisfied. Good believer. And what happened? Because of the abundance of what, they, what he saw and what he took into his heart and into his mind over and over and over again, he killed his parents. He's sitting there. He calls the police and he says, I killed my parents. And he doesn't even know what to say. He's saying, he said, I, I don't know. Because of these games, I wanted to see blood. I wanted to see death. And it was a, it's a very sad story. And he's a believer. God says, choose this day whom you're going to serve. But as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. Some questions that we can ask ourselves, even as we are studying this, is, Lord, who am I serving? I know I'm serving. I, I'm I'm reading your word. Uh, am I reading your word? Am I praying? Am I spending time in your presence? What am I filling into my mind and my spirit? Are there are there things that are fruitful for the kingdom of God? You know, a lot of students in our church, they come and ask me, Pastor, is it okay to listen to, uh, you know, uh, secular songs? 
they they're not bad they don't have any bad words they don't uh, just secular songs so the answer was it's not bad but it's not good also it's not bad but does it you know bring fruit in your life does it bring you closer to jesus is it okay to play games it's okay you can play but does it bring you closer to jesus right uh, now we're not trying to be legalistic here i right? so you have to do this dog no. have as a choice have control over things that you do set priorities set examples right so in your own life you know, for your family for your children set certain examples you now some of the things we do is you know my children they play they take your phone they play video games and all of it but i i, I time them i say okay only 15 minutes only half an hour after half an hour they know they got to give it back and then when we sit for prayer we tell them what is the importance of prayer we tell them what is the importance of worship and what do these video games do how does it affect you and we just share it with them we don't force it into them so there are times my little boy comes and says i don't feel like playing today i don't feel like playing video games it's good because during the prayer time we just sit and share we fill in their hearts we put in their hearts at a young age what is important uh you know i keep sharing with my children you know uh, i used to like to play guitar when i was small you know why don't you play drums so get them interested in other things right you fill in their heart what you put in their heart is what they will do when they grow up same thing in our lives you fill in their heart fill your heart with the word of god with the promises of god that's what will come out of our hearts right uh okay uh any questions any thoughts uh any questions everything okay am i going too fast is is everything all right okay all right uh we'll take a break um uh, and we'll come back and we'll start with chapter 6 uh, right now we are on chapter 5 we've completed chapter 5 we'll start with chapter 6 after the break so uh we'll take a 15 minute break uh, we'll come back at 11:00 and we'll start with chapter 6 thank you